He is more than a story. He is more than a comic book superhero. He is more than a symbol of hope. He represents our greatest aspirations. He is everything we think we can be. And yet, even with all the strength and all the power in all of the world, he may not be able to meet his greatest challenges and redeem his family's legacy. For he is the son of El. Chapter 24 Changing of the Guard As Batman had promised, the mass prison break on election night did not last long in the news cycle. Kaznia became the center of the world's attention. Their civil war ended in a bloody massacre, and the surviving faction had new ideals for their nation. Many of their soldiers had become enhanced with drugs and cybernetics and believed they were the first step in a superior mankind. Clark was embarrassed when they compared themselves to him, a comparison made all too often. At Christmas dinner that year, Martha provided a feast for the two of them, determined to not let global politics dampen their holiday spirit. Without Jonathan, she had taken to saying the grace before each meal. Lord, thank you for the blessings before us and the fleeting time we have to share it. We are grateful for the opportunities you surround us with. We may not always meet the heights you set for us, but we appreciate the repeated chances you offer us to meet them. I don't know if that sentence made any sense, Lord, but I know you'll forgive me and give me another chance to get it right. Amen. Clark chuckled and let himself enjoy the dinner, though news that week preoccupied his mind. Kaznia had enabled a coup in one of their neighboring nations. When the coup was successful, Kaznia annexed them. This was their first aggressive step toward expanding their borders. Nations around the world nervously took note. Lex Luthor had embraced this potential crisis and made it a recurring talking point. As president-elect, Luthor was not shy to speak out against the Kaznian president, Vandal Savage. He is a brute and a bully, and America does not tolerate that kind of behavior. We'll be ready to put him down if he steps out of line. This talk was written off by Vandal Savage. Big words for a little man. Savage was just as eager to make his own threats. Luther thinks he has some special perspective from his glass tower, but the only vantage he has gained from there is a sheltered life. When he realizes how soft he is, he will crawl back into his shell. We are not afraid of him. The two of them volleyed attacks at one another through weekly press conferences. Clark was reminded of bickering children. They were two school bullies trying to show off on the playground. As far as Clark could tell, it was all talk. Politics seemed to center around making big claims with little action to support them. This was no less true of Luther's campaign promises. When his team transitioned to the White House, they were far too preoccupied with foreign affairs to show any concern for the Justice League. At least for that, Clark was grateful. Colonel Steve Trevor and his assistant, Etta Candy, continued visiting the Hall of Justice. They came to give the League regular debriefings, even after Luther's presidency had begun. The League's security clearance was the same as it had been, only under Luther, they no longer had a participatory role in Kaznia. This was not at all peculiar to Colonel Trevor. Basically, the whole thing's going from a cold war to a hot one. That changes the entire playing field, and we don't want to entangle our League of Unsanctioned Superheroes in the red tape, so you all just sit back and let the military handle this. Oliver Queen, the Green Arrow, scoffed, pushing his chair away from the table and dropping his composure. No offense, Trevor. But do you really think your military is ready to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Kaznia's enhanced soldiers? Unlike my friends here, I don't have any powers, and I've been in those trenches with years of experience. Trust me when I tell you it's not something your boys are going to handle." Trevor replied with the same casual smile he typically wore. I think you'd be surprised what our boys can handle, but no, we don't plan to send them in. We've put together our own task force of especially capable humans. Oliver wasn't impressed. Oh really? And who have you possibly found for your team that isn't already on the Justice League? Let's just say, not all persons of interest were released in the election night prison break. Argus has its own facilities for imprisoning anyone we take interest in. Task Force X recruits from that pool. General Trevor gave Superman a wink with this comment, and Clark instantly knew who he was referring to. 
Argus had taken two particular vigilantes, Bloodsport and Peacemaker, into custody after Superman had captured them. Clark raised a single eyebrow. What makes you think these prisoners of yours are going to cooperate? For the first time, Steve's cool demeanor slipped just a little as he quickly sought to distance himself from this information. First off, Task Force X is not my department. Amanda Waller runs that project and she is stone cold. She's implanted remote explosives in the prisoners' spines, so they don't really have a choice. They're sent in when it's a no-win situation. This strategy has led to a surprising number of wins over the years, though not without losses. There's a reason Task Force X is nicknamed the Suicide Squad. Clark was surprised. This was the first Trevor had mentioned it. Clark turned directly to Miss Candy and directed his question to her. This task force isn't new? Oh no, Mr. Superman, sir. Task Force X has been operational for some time now. The Suicide Squad isn't new, but the current members are new to the squad. They haven't been broken in yet, but we'll soon have them performing covert operations in Kaznia, no doubt. This prospect drew out Wonder Woman's indignation. She pounded a fist on the table and asserted her stance. There is no need to let these childish games continue. The threat of Kaznia need not loom over us when we have the clear advantage. The Justice League is more than equipped to end this war tonight. General Trevor knew it was time to rein in the conversation. I appreciate your appetite for destruction, your highness, but the logistics of sorting out the aftermath of letting the Justice League unilaterally decide this? Let's just say, it's not a best case scenario. That's a hornet's nest we are trying to avoid. Diana did not offer an argument, though it was clear she was not at all convinced. Steve Trevor wrapped up the meeting, and though Batman had remained silent throughout the debriefing, he approached the colonel afterward to speak with him on the side. In the normal meandering that unfolds after a workplace meeting, Clark attempted to catch a word with Diana. This was the first monthly debriefing she had attended since her return from Themyscira. Clark wasn't sure where to start. In his head, he was entertaining the idea of asking her out on a date. It's good to see you back, Diana. It is good to be back, Kalel. Though as usual, it is the worst of circumstances that bring me here. Oh, I don't think that always has to be the case. Really? And what other cases are you thinking of? Clark had meant to beat around the bush a little. He hadn't imagined she would outright ask his intent. Though knowing Diana, he should have expected it. Wonder Woman seemed so much larger than life that Clark was unsure how to begin asking her out. While he attempted to conjure the appropriate words, Steve Trevor approached them. What do you say, princess? Should we get dinner here in Starling before flying back to DC? Diana's face lit up as he asked her. Yes, Steve. I think that would be most appropriate. I talked to Black Canary, and she suggested to me several of her favorite restaurants. So it's a date then. Excellent. Are you ready? Steve offered his arm to Diana, though she hesitated and turned back to Superman. Almost. Kalel was just about to say something. Clark swallowed, smiled, and did his best to move on in stride. It's nothing that can't wait for another time. You two go on. Have a lovely dinner. Clark watched them go, feeling just a bit embarrassed by himself for not piecing together that something might be happening between Diana and Steve. He had long looked forward to seeing Diana again, but assured himself, with a war pending, this was no time to be dating a co-worker. Over the course of months, the Kaznia conflict heated up as their military concentrated along the nation's borders. Neighboring nations fortified their defenses while President Luther deployed troops to the area. Kaznia appeared to be deadlocked until several Eastern European nations announced their allegiance to the burgeoning national superpower. In exchange for their unique weapons technology, Kaznia was forming a global alliance. Amidst their growing tensions, one thing was clear. There was no place in this war for him or the Justice League. Reflecting on Batman's dire warnings from months earlier, Clark suspected his ability to help had been drastically overstated. By summer, Kaznian allies were checkered around the world. The threat of a raging world war loomed imminent. While nearly every nation was ready to attack their neighbors, a phenomenon of headaches began to be felt worldwide. It was just a little at first, but with each day, more and more people were reporting that their brains were hurting. What began as a small bother grew into a mind-numbing pain that made basic tasks nearly impossible. It appeared no one was spared from this condition, though all sides of the war suspected the other of such sabotage. When it was finally agreed the headaches were not the intentional creation of either side, accusations began again. 
this time saying that the headaches were the byproduct of some experimental technology. At first, Clark too was a victim of these headaches, though with concentration, he managed to refocus his attention and make the pain inconsequential. Most of the Justice League was incapacitated, save for Clark, Diana, Clark's cousin Arthur, Jean Jones, and the Green Lantern, Hal Jordan, who all managed to find the willpower to overcome the pain. Barry Allen, the Flash, found another way to escape the headaches. He kept himself constantly moving in what he was calling the Speed Force. His movements became a blur and fractured, as though he were not wholly present. His voice vibrated from all around them when he spoke. Even without succumbing to the headaches, the remaining Justice League members did not miss it when the name of their attacker rang out in the minds of every being on the planet. Starro. The world collectively thought, Starro. Jean Jones pointed them all to look in the sky at what looked like a giant starfish threatening to eclipse the sun. Jean could sense it. This was not a craft, but a very large living being. It was plummeting toward Earth, leaving little time for the League to formalize a strategy. Its trajectory was aiming to the sea, far off of the coast of them in the midst of the Pacific Ocean. Approaching Starro, Clark felt the pain in his head increase. His friends around him were likewise daunted, all but the Flash, who as usual, was pulling ahead as the group struggled. Clark remembered their race together and reached out to the Flash, not with his hand, but with his heart. He managed to take an unseen hold of the Flash's wake of energy. For a moment, he merged into the slipstream of this thing Barry called the Speed Force. In that moment, the pain disappeared altogether, and Clark swept through the sky with the same speed he felt during his race with the Flash. As Superman burst ahead of them, the rest of the Justice League were inspired, driving themselves to push away the pain and battle onward toward their galactic attacker. As the massive bean approached and the Justice League struggled in every moment, they let their instincts take over. They had done this many times before. The Flash and Aquaman round ground cover over the ocean's surface, while Superman, Wonder Woman, Green Lantern, and Martian Manhunter flew up to meet Starro head on. The closer they came to the enormous monster, the greater their mental struggle. The act of punching the creature felt flaccid and ineffective. Jean Jones risked letting down his guard and attempted to enter Starro's mind. The agony he felt from this could be seen on his face and throughout his body. Yet Starro yielded only dozens of meters from sea level. Aquaman and the Flash joined the team's ineffectual barrage, yet Starro inched ever downward as they fought to push back. Hal Jordan had the most powerful effect, forming a fist of massive green light projected from his ring. It seemed there were moments when he might be pushing back upward. He tried every manner of machinery he could conjure, including an enormous jackhammer to great effect, yet the creature kept coming. Nothing any of them did could prove effective before the mental strain overtook their attempts. As they found themselves repelled back all at once, a booming voice sounded from the sky above Starro. You all may want to move back from this. I've got it under control. No other warning was given. A massive glowing green star-shaped mechanical container materialized around Starro. The inconceivably large machine began wrapping itself around the enormous creature. Gears, riggings, and panels rearranged themselves, swallowing Starro inside. The glowing green machine in the sky began folding in on itself and backwards, until it was impossible that Starro could have survived. When the container opened up again, there was no apparent trace of the monster inside of it. As instantaneously as it had appeared, the mechanical container vanished. The device emanated from above, emerging from the ring of a man in the same Green Lantern uniform as Hal Jordan, but with the addition of a glowing green helmet covering his face and head. He flew directly toward Hal as the helmet dematerialized, funneling back into his ring. Unsure what to expect under the helmet, they were all a little surprised when the man appeared to be human. He was a dark-skinned man with a stern expression. Unlike Hal, he didn't wear a mask over his eyes. Instead, his eyes were glowing with the brilliant green light of his ring. This new Green Lantern was not at all celebratory of his victory. He came to a halt in front of everyone where Hal was projecting a hovering platform for the group to stand on. Hal Jordan, I'm John Stewart with the Green Lantern Corps, and I'm relieving you of duty. You're what now? You are to report back to Oa for training. Hold on, what? Where? Oa. The home planet of the Green Lantern. Where's that? And why am I supposed to go? It's the first band adjacent to the nucleus of the Oana Quadrant of our galaxy. And not knowing that, 
is, by itself, enough reason alone that you should be removed from duty. That's ridiculous. How am I supposed to know that? Why is that any reason to remove me from duty? It's not just that, Hal. Can I call you Hal? I'm not so sure just yet. Clark could see all of this was hard news for his friend to take. He put his hand on Hal's shoulder, assuring him he was there with friends. Hal looked over to Clark and his face softened. Turning back to John Stewart, he tried to start over. I mean, yeah, sure, you can call me Hal. But do you want to go somewhere to talk so we don't have to hover above the sea like this? John Stewart's stern expression relaxed some. Yeah, we can do that. Where do you suggest? How about we go back to the Hall of Justice? Where now? Barry was taken a bit by surprise hearing this question and blurted out. Now I thought everyone knew where the Hall of Justice was. John Stewart chuckled. Let's just say I've been away for a while. Back in Starling City at the Hall of Justice, they all learned that shortly after Hal had become the Green Lantern, John Stewart was visited and recruited by the Green Lantern Corps. Earth had never been deemed worthy of being assigned a Green Lantern, but after Hal came upon his ring by accident, it was decided that a proper Green Lantern should be sent to Earth. John had spent the last four years training until he was ready to relieve Hal, so that Hal could receive the same training. John put it gently. It's not your lack of raw talent, that is for sure. It took me days to get my ring to do anything more than make this outfit. Your problem is that there's a lot of basic training you missed. You're operating out here without a manual. It is clear you don't understand the potential of your ring. How would you know what I do and don't understand about my ring? It messages Oa when you recharge it with the lantern. The ring sends an operation report, so we get to see everything you make. And though I have a deep respect for all you've accomplished on your own, I've got to tell you how. You have no idea what these rings can do. The technology we have access to on Oa is like nothing you've ever seen. Once you learn how to reproduce this kind of tech, your days of massive jackhammers will be behind you. Hal looked as though he were taste testing some subtle flavor. Yeah? Like that thing you captured Starro in? Exactly. And that helmet I was wearing. That thing blocks out Starro's brainwave disruption. My friend, you have no idea where the possibilities even begin. You've got to do this. Oa will change your life. Hal didn't need any more persuading. He agreed. After tending to his personal affairs, he would go to Oa and take his responsibility as a Green Lantern to heart. When the matter was finally settled, Clark had questions of his own. Before we adjourn, I think we'd all like to know what that thing was. What's Starro's deal? John answered with a matter-of-fact authority. Starro is what we call a xenogalactic parasite. If he had made it into the ocean, he would have gone into a spawning state. Around the table, everyone made a frightful expression. The Flash outright shuddered at the thought. Ew, did you say spawning? Clark wondered how much worse Starro would be. How bad would the headaches have gotten after that? John Stewart looked coldly at Superman. The headaches would have been the least of your problems by then. Billions of identical spawns seeking out every living creature large enough to attach to. Everyone is mind controlled until Star has leached the planet dry. After a cannibalizing purge, the most powerful of their species survives to repeat the process. One of the core duties of the Green Lantern Corps is to prevent this from happening whenever possible. Hal's mouth hung agape. So, there's more of those things? Let's just say that wasn't my first Star to departiculate. The Green Lantern has very specific equipment for dealing with this for a very good reason. Star would feed this galaxy out of existence if left unchecked. Hal Jordan had a new appreciation of his mission at hand. Okay, wow. I can see why I need some training. Don't worry, Hal. You're not the only one. They had me come here to relieve you because I was the most ahead in my training in comparison to the other humans on Oa. I expect someone will come and relieve me some years from now. There are other humans on Oa? Oh, sure. They've got a handful of us. They look for cadets with the willpower needed to withstand threats like Starro. It looks like the ring was right in choosing you. You certainly have the chops. You just need to sharpen them. As their meeting wrapped up, Clark couldn't help notice that John Stewart was intently eyeing him. When everyone was dispersing to return home, to sort out the damage done by Starro's attack, Clark managed to ask John if there was anything he could help him with. Oh, me? I... I just... I'm sorry, Superman. That was rude of me. Back on Oa, I... I've heard a lot about the reputation of Kryptonians, and I shouldn't have been staring. Clark wasn't offended. More than anything, he was deeply curious. 
What do you know about Krypton? I don't know. You might not like what you hear. I think I should hear it. Well, Krypton and your people, you're colonizers from another dimension. You all hail from a place called Kandor. Krypton was their entry point to our realm, and they would have expanded into the rest of the galaxy and further if the Green Lantern weren't on guard. I'm sorry. That sounds pretty bad. I don't blame you if you don't trust me. No, it's not that at all. I was reading about you for years before ever even hearing about Oa and the Lantern. I know you genuinely try to help. I just can't understand how you turned out this way. I mean, you are nothing like any Kryptonian I've ever heard of. Well, uh, I guess I got lucky and had good parents. I guess so. Thanks, John. I appreciate you opening up to me. Do you mind if I call you John? Actually, my friends call me Stuart. Well, thanks, Stuart. I look forward to working with you. John Stewart had to see how Jordan backed to Oa before he could officially take on his duty as Green Lantern. In that time, the world reeled in its recovery from the Starro incident. As Lex Luthor had promised, alien invaders were a very real possibility. A monster had come from outer space. More surprising still, the galaxy had its own police force for this exact situation. Clark had no doubt Lex Luthor would find a way to use this victory against the Justice League and twist it to his advantage. Considering all he was learning about Krypton, Clark couldn't entirely blame him. Thank you for listening. I'm Isaac Bluefoot. Sign of L is written and produced by myself. If you're enjoying this audiobook, please share the experience. Recommend it to friends and write a review. I want this story to reach as many ears as possible and I'm so grateful to everyone helping to spread the word. Another way to show your support is at patreon.com slash bluefoot. This story was inspired by the Superman and DC comics and characters originally created by Jerry Siegel and Joe Schuster, with additional contributions by Alfred Bester, Martin O'Dell, William Moulton Marston, Harry G. Peter, Mort Weisinger, George Papp, Robert Kaniger, Ross Andrew, John Byrne, Joe Gill, Pat Boyette, Bill Finger, Bob Kane, Paul Norris, Joseph Samuelson, Joe Serta, John Broom, Gil Kane, Gardner Fox, Mike Sikowski, Dennis O'Neill, and Neil Adams. Manuscript editing assistance by Trisha Reel. Music in this episode was made by Blue Dot Sessions, Abstract Nostalgic Fractal Systems, Poddington Bear, Vortex, Nihilor, Kirk Osamayo, Chad Crouch, and Audio Binger. See the episode notes for details. For more of my work, get yourself a deck of Omen Quest cards at omenquestcards.com, a deck of cards like nothing else. And be sure to listen to the next episode, Chapter 25, Foreign Powers. <laughs>